Anyway, if you want, please open your Bibles, if you have one, to uh, 1 Kings chapter 15. We're going to continue going through 1 Kings together. And we're going to be seeing the uh, musical chairs of kingdoms as we go down through here. It gets pretty crazy. Um, And, you know, a lot of the uh, references that you'll find um, to some of the stories and some of the record that we have in Kings are going to be reviewed again when we get to Chronicles. And a lot of the guys in these in First and Second Kings, they'll be mentioned again. Um, you might wonder why they do that. Um, there's some information in each one of the other books that we don't have necessarily in the one that we're going through right now. So um, it will just enhance our understanding of uh, what's happening here. So I'm going to go ahead and start reading here a little bit, and uh, we'll get this going. Chapter 15, verse 1. In the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, Abijam became king over Judah. He reigned three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Maaka, the grandmother of Abishalom. And he walked in all of the sins of his father, which he had done before him. His heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. Nevertheless, for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem by setting up his son after him and by establishing Jerusalem. Because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and had not turned aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. So interesting, we have this little uh, historical narrative here about David once again. And this king that we're looking at here, um, he, uh, Abijam, he... um, doesn't last very long. He's only there and installed in that position for, well, God has allowed it for a very short time, and he has a purpose in allowing Abijam to reign. It says in verse 4 that it's for David's sake that he did it. For David's sake, he wanted to have a lamp in Jerusalem by setting up his son after him to establish Jerusalem. Now, you might remember... One of uh, David's sons um, was um, Absalom. And you all remember what happened to Absalom, right? Um, This is from Absalom's line. That's why we see the name Abishalom. And uh, you'll see that as we go down through here a little bit. But you remember that it was Absalom that betrayed David. And Absalom met a terrible fate on the battlefield. Um, He was hung (laughs) by his hair, and then he was slaughtered. Um, But he was a traitor. And, you know, you remember the grief that he caused David. Um, All the soldiers that had laid their lives down for David were almost brushed off, if you will, For the sake of his son Absalom, he mourned over the traitor more than he mourned over the patriots. And uh, that didn't go over real well with some of his uh, counselors and some of his leaders. But is that the only thing that David did wrong? Was Uriah the Hittite? I mean, you know, you think about, uh, yeah, Bathsheba is what we're referring to here, exactly. But what we're seeing in a lot of these stories as we go down through here, and I think we're going to see the word come up again, um, sodomy, sodomizing, um, men having sex with men. Um, This was happening on a regular basis, and I don't think that of all of David's faults that he may have had, 
this is one line that David never crossed. I think God honored, honored that because all of these other guys, for the most part, probably partook in a lot of the perverted behavior that was going on in the kingdoms during this time. When your leaders are doing it, it kind of feels right. Kind of feels like maybe it's okay if the leaders are doing it. And, and this is, you know, this is the very thing that destroys a nation. It's the very thing that takes God's hand of blessing off of a nation. And yes, it's about sex. Sex is a very precious thing in God's eyes when it's properly enjoyed. But when the enemy comes along and puts it in the minds of evil men to totally subvert that invention of God and pervert it, it's very serious business. Well, we know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. Dan has told me stories about being over there and seeing it, the desolation that was left. I think he even brought some Sodom dirt home with a shoebox full of Sodom dirt. So leave it at your house. Um, <laughs> and don't try to plant a garden in it. It probably won't grow. Anyway, um, so this guy here is not a whole lot different. But again, God does things, I think, sometimes that we might look at and go, I don't really understand why you're doing this, Lord. Why would you allow this little brat to reign for three years, and all he's going to do is right away, he's going to turn against the Lord. And you know that he's going to do that, Lord, but yet you put him in that spot anyway. And uh, it's just a temporary spot for this king, Abijim, and he doesn't last very long at all. Verse 6 tells us that there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all the days of his life. You know, we, we read that earlier um, up in chapter 14 in verse 30. It says it there too, that there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all of their days. These guys battled with one another for their whole lives because of family squabbles, because they... One wanted to have power over the other one, and none of it was uh, okayed by God. He allowed it to happen, but it just shows you um, the condition spiritually of Judah and Israel. So down in verse 6, it says that the rest of the acts of Abijam, and of course, we didn't read very much about Abijam. He just wasn't loyal to the Lord. Um, he practiced all the wickedness of his uh, fathers and his family. So the rest of the acts of Abijam and the things that he did are written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah. And, of course, there was war between Abijam and Jeroboam. So there's war everywhere going on, right? One king dies, another one gets seated. They just continue the same behavior of battling one another. So in the 20th year of Jeroboam, the king of Israel, Asa became king over Judah. Now, Asa is a unique one. He reigned for 41 years in Jerusalem. His grandmother's name was Maacha, the granddaughter of Abishalom. Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord as did his father David. He banished the perverted, or the sodomites, that's where that word is found, from the land. And he removed all of the idols that his fathers had made. So he's cleaning house, this king. And it's interesting that he banishes these people, these, these perverted people, are no longer welcome in the land. And so they're banished. We don't know how they survived. We don't know if they 
dried up uh, in the desert or if they went and lived somewhere else. We don't know. But they were no longer welcome in Jerusalem and in the area there. And he also removed Maaka, his grandmother, from being the queen mother, the little queen bee of the cults, right? Because she had made an obscene image of Astra. And Asa cut down her obscene image, and he burned it by the brook Kidron. But the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was loyal to the Lord all of his days. He was trying to bring reform to the nation. He was trying to clean it up, trying to get back to God. But there's not really any record here of a uh, conversion experience or repentance or anything like that. It actually looks more like uh, political maneuvering to try to get the nation back um, to its strength that it had earlier. Because, you know, when you allow this type of behavior to permeate your society, your society grows weaker. We become weaker. Our military has become weaker because we've allowed this junk to creep in, in into our military. And, you know, during prayer tonight, we were... Uh, one of the things that came up in my mind was that what was going on over in Europe and France and Spain and all these countries where, you know, they're burning these places down. It, it looks like the first year of COVID here, what, what happened here, all that burning and the rioting and all of that stuff that was going on, it's all going on over there right now. It's pretty amazing that that same spirit, that same mindset uh, as much as it debilitated us, people don't learn from it. And, and, uh, and once again, that whole thing over there, part of the issue, again, is race. There was a man killed by an officer, and that started one of the riots. And then one of the rulers decided, hey, you guys are going to have to work for a living now. And they didn't like that, so they started burning down their country. So it's, this, is, uh, this is nuts. But it's not unique to the United States of America, which tells us something really, really important. This is a spirit. This is a demonic spirit that has been allowed by God to begin to do what he is going to do. And it's going to have far-reaching consequences. So yes, he did kick out the Sodomites. From the land. He did remove the idols that his dad made. That's all really good stuff. He burned the image that his grandmother was worshiping. And it's not just a statue of Asherah, it's an obscene statue. It's a perverted, sick statue. It just shows you how deeply ingrained. This stuff is when it gets so close to the throne that this guy's grandmother is totally immersed. She's considered the queen mother. Quite the title. And it tells us in verse 15 that he also brought into the house of the Lord the things which his father had dedicated and the things which he himself had dedicated, silver and gold and utensils. So he was trying to bring back some of the things that were in the temple, some of the precious items that had been placed in there. They were replaced with images and all different types of idol worshiping uh, material in there, altars to burn, incense and sacrifice uh, to, to false gods. This gets so bad that for 400 years, I believe it's 400, for about 400 years, they didn't have any scripture. They had no clue where their Bible was because it was buried in the temple. It was buried under all the stuff that Israel had accumulated and Judah had accumulated from worshiping false idols. And it wasn't until some 400 years later when another king came along 
and we met him by name already. He's going to come on the scene, Josiah, and there's going to be a revival. And he's going to find God's word. And the people are going to be so overjoyed by the finding of the Bible, their Bible, their scrolls. When you do not have the word, when you do not take the time to read the word, protect it, preserve it, honor it, then you don't have a compass. You don't have real direction for your life. You're just going to go with the flow. You know, as Pastor Chuck used to say years ago, he used to say, you know, any old fish can, you know, swim downstream with the rest. It takes a strong fish to turn around to swim against the current. And that's exactly what we're called to do as believers. We don't go along with everything. We, we turn around and we go against it. We swim against the current of the evil things that are going on in the world. So Baasha, verse 17, the king of Israel, came up against Judah, and he built Ramah. So he puts this, begins to build this city that's going to kind of block, <clears throat> going to kind of block um, Judah to where they're not going to be able to come and go as they need to. So he begins construction on Ramah that he might let none go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. Then Asa took all the silver. Now here's where Asa's downfall was. He took all the silver and the gold that was left in the treasuries of the house of the Lord and the treasuries of the king's house, and he delivered them into the hands of his servants. And King Asa sent them to Ben-Hadad, the son of Tamribam, Tam. Rimmon, <laughs> who was the son of Hezion, the king of Syria, who dwelt in Damascus. So now he's taken all these treasures, he's sending them by messenger to this king in Syria, and he said, let there be a treaty between you and me, as there was, as there was between my father and your father. You see, I have sent you a present of silver and gold. So come and break your treaty with Baasha, king of Israel, so that he will withdraw from me. So Ben-Hadad heeded King Asa and sent the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel. And he attacked Ijon, Dan, Abel, Beth, Ma Maaka, and all of Chinneroth with all the land of Naphtali. Now it happened when Baasha heard it, that he stopped building Rama. He had other things he had to deal with. He didn't have time to continue building this, this uh, blockade. So he stopped the construction, and, and he remained in Tirza, obviously, to take care of some of the problems that were going on between these kings. So King Asa makes a proclamation throughout all Judah, and no one was exempt. So they took away all the stones in the timber of Ramah, which Baasha had used for building. And with them, King Asa built Geba of Benjamin and Mizpah. The rest of all of the acts of Asa and all of his might and all that he did in the cities which he built, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? But in the time of his old age, he was diseased in his feet. So Asa rested with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father. And then Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his place. So that's our little story about Asa. Asa did a lot of really good things, made a few foolish decisions, which cost him dearly. And we see that perhaps his um, last days were pretty darn uncomfortable. Evidently, he must have had some kind of a 
circulation problem, gangrene, gout, who knows, but whatever it was, it was enough to take him out. <clears throat> now, verse 25, Nadab, the son of Jeroboam, became king over Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah. And he reigned over Israel two years. So he didn't last very long either. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and he walked in the way of his father, and in his sin, by which he made Israel sin. And then Baasha, the son of Ahijah, of the house of Ishakar, conspired against him. But Baasha killed him at Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines, while Nadab and all of Israel laid siege to Gibbethon. Baasha killed him in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, and he reigned in his place. And it was so when he became king that he killed all of the house of Jeroboam, prophecy being fulfilled. He did not leave to Jeroboam anyone that breathed until he had destroyed him according to the word of the Lord which he had spoken by his servant Ahijah the Shilonite. Because of the sins of Jeroboam which he had sinned and by which he made Israel sin, because of his provocation with which he had provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger. Can you imagine provoking God? I mean, that's really intense, isn't it? you got to have a pretty darn big ego to think that you can do something like that, to provoke the creator of the universe. Unbelievable. I don't know what these people are thinking, but I would assume that the same kind of thing goes on still today. Now, you know, we might think, well, you know, I used to have a, uh, maybe a drinking problem, and I know that probably made God angry, and uh, the drugs, and maybe I was impure sexually, and all these different things in my life, and, you know, uh, provoking the Lord to anger. Well, I think what we're looking at here is a much bigger deal than what you and I have experienced in our journey uh, coming to the cross. Yeah, we get disciplined. Yeah, we get spanked. He's not going to let us get away with living a, the double life, if you will, undercover Christian, you know, uh, Christian by day and crazy man by night or whatever. Um, he sees those things, and he disciplines us. He disciplines us as a father would discipline his child. That is a different thing than what we're looking at here. Provocation coming by these guys right here thinking that they could literally stand against God and win. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I know that in my life, whenever I did something that I knew did not please the Lord, I knew that I was doing wrong. And I knew that there were going to be consequences for that wrong. That's how much the Lord loves us. That's how much the Father loves us. That he will discipline his people. But this is more than just discipline. You might remember this prophecy that Ahijah gave. Concerning Jeroboam saying that there would not be one person in his bloodline to carry on his bloodline because of the sins of Jeroboam. Not only did Jeroboam sin horrible sins, but he also made Israel sin. So now here you got the accountability of being a leader and misleading your people into these acts of lewdness or whatever you want to call it, um, and God is holding Jeroboam responsible for it. 
Because he's the leader. He knows better. So verse 33, um, in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, Baasha, the son of Ahijah, became king over Israel in Terzah, and he reigned for 24 years. So now this guy's on the scene for quite a while, and he did evil, <laughs> jeez, in the sight of the Lord. And what did he do? He walked in the way of Jeroboam and in his sin by which he had made Israel sin. What is up? Wouldn't you think that Baasha would get a clue here? Seeing what happened to Jeroboam, seeing what's happening to the nation, and how Asa tried so hard to try to square things away, but the people wouldn't have it. They had hardened their hearts against God. And now... You want to party? You want to be perverted? You want to do evil things? You want to provoke the creator of the universe? Okay, here's another one I'm going to let you have for 20-some years. You know, it kind of reminds me of that sniveling out, out, in the, out in the wilderness when the children of Israel were roaming around and they said, oh, I'm so sick of manna, you know. <laughs> We're making a man of pancakes and banana bread, and we can't get any more recipes for this. I'm sick of this. We need some meat. Think about that. God from heaven is supplying them nourishment to keep them healthy and strong, and they're complaining about it. I don't know. I'd probably complain too, maybe. I don't know. I like a chunk of meat once in a while, right? Or maybe some fish or something. But they wanted it so much, they complained so much, God said, okay, you want it? I'm going to give you so much of it, you're going to be puking. You're going to get sick of it. You're never going to look at another bird for the rest of your life. And it's kind of like, you know, what we're seeing here. You guys want to live that way? You want to continue down that road? Okay. You know, I did, he did the same thing to Pharaoh, didn't he? I mean, you read that. You read that story about Pharaoh. It's very interesting because every time Moses went, Moses said, hey, hey, Pharaoh, you know, God said, let us go out to worship. Let us get out there and worship our God. And, and the Bible says over and over and over again, Pharaoh hardened his heart against the words of Moses and would not let the people go. That goes all the way through the whole process until the very end. The very end when the firstborn are going to be taken. And, and the whole wording now changes. Instead of it saying, Pharaoh hardened his heart against Moses. It says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart against Moses. And you might think, that's not fair. I mean, maybe Pharaoh would have repented. You mean God gave up on him? Yeah. Yeah. You know, people can get to a certain place where their hearts are so hard, their hearts are so callous, so evil, so polluted, that God knows they will never repent. They're so steeped in their evil, they will never come out of it. That's scary. That really is scary stuff to think that that could be going on right now in people's lives. Yeah, we pray for them. We see them doing what they do out there. We, we see the evil. We know that it's demonic. But their hearts are so hardened and so callous that there's going to be a time, if it hasn't already come in some of their lives, where God's just going to say, I'm going to give you over to your reprobate behavior. And you're going to live it out. You know, if that was just done on an individual basis, that would be something that we would think, well, yeah, that's probably a good thing. But this is being done on a national level. This is huge. So 
so he does evil in the sight of the Lord and walks in the way of Jeroboam and he sinned that he made Israel sin. Then chapter 1 of verse 16, or verse 1 says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jehu, the son of Hanani, against Baasha, saying, Inasmuch as I lifted you out of the dust, and I made you ruler over my people Israel, and you have walked in the way of Jeroboam, and you have made my people Israel sin, to provoke me to anger with their sins. Surely I will take away the posterity, the posterity of Baasha and the posterity of his house again, and I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. The dogs will eat whoever belongs to Baasha and dies in the city, and the birds of the air shall eat whoever dies in the fields. Now the rest of the acts of Baasha, what he did, and his might, are written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. So Baasha rested with his fathers and was buried in Terzah. So then Elah, his son, reigned in his place. And also... Now, remember what he said about, his, about Baasha's family. So now we have one of his sons taking the throne, um, Elah, who takes the throne in his father's place. But there's a prophecy about Elah and his brothers and his sisters and his cousins and their whole family. And also, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Jehu, the son of Hanani, against Baasha and his house because of the evil that he did in the sight of the Lord and provoking him to anger with the work of his hands in being like the house of Jeroboam and because he killed them. So in the 26th year of Asa, king of Judah, Elah, the son of Baasha, became king over Israel and reigned for two years. Now his servant, Zimri, commander of half of his chariots conspired against him as he was in Tirzah, drinking himself drunk in the house of Arza, steward of his house in Tirzah. And Zimri went in and struck him and killed him in the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah, and he reigned in his place. And then it came to pass when he began to reign, as soon as he was seated on the throne, that he killed all of the household of Baasha. He did not leave him one male, neither of his relatives nor of his friends. So once again, the same fate comes to this household of Baasha. Baasha. And again, um, this man who the king trusted, was a traitor, and waited until the king was smashed, drunk, and uh, Zimri went in there and assassinated him, slaughtered him. But in doing so, he was beginning to fulfill the prophecy concerning this king and his family. And so we find that he did wind up taking out all of his relatives, (laughs) and even his friends. How would you like to be Baasha's friend? And you'd be saying, oh, no, no, I don't know the guy, right? You know, no, sorry, we've seen you partying with him. You're going down to. So Zimri, he destroyed all the household of Baasha, according to the word of the Lord which he spoke against Baasha by Jehu the prophet. For all of the sins of Baasha and the sins of Elah, his son, by which they had sinned and by which they had made Israel sin in provoking the Lord God of Israel to anger with their idols. Around and around and around we go, right? 
No lessons learned, nothing but rebellion, power hungry, people who have chosen to rise up against God. You got to think maybe um, with all the other false gods that are out there in their, in their area there where they live, there was a lot of idol worship going on. This stuff was pretty much integrated right into Jewish society. And, you know, that, that even went on during uh, the time of Rome. Um, when Christians in Corinth would go and light incense to another god, and then they would go to church. Because it was just what you did. It was just kind of what you do to get along. You go along to get along. Don't want to rock the boat. But even that far in, they're still compromising with the enemy. Why do we compromise with the enemy today? Well, I think the Christians sometimes compromise because maybe they're a little ashamed of being Christians. I mean, look at all the fun they're having out there, you guys. Look at all the stuff we're missing out on out there. Yeah, I know, I can't. Christians don't smile. We don't laugh. We don't have fun. We're just a bunch of fuddy-duddies reading our Bibles all the time. Wow. Well, I'll tell you what. I have been more blessed having a Christian family than having a party family any day, right? Millions of times over. So these people are continuing provoking the Lord. They're provoking Yahweh, Elohim. It's specific. That's why it doesn't just say God. It's the Lord God. He has a name. So the rest of the acts of Elah, again, we will find them in the book of Chronicles. So in the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah, Asa's been around for quite a while. He's seen a few kings come and go. I would imagine he's probably sitting back and he's probably learning a little bit. Because he was the one that did try to turn the hearts of the people. But you know, if you don't repent, it's kind of hard to really get your heart right with God. You guys remember the towers going down. You probably remember right where you were when you saw it happen. I do. I remember exactly what I was doing when I saw that first plane hit. And I was glued to my TV for the rest of the time. And that next Sunday, boy, I'll tell you what, Calvary Chapel McMinnville was bursting at the seams. People were scared. People didn't know what was going to happen. And what did they do? They ran to God for a week, yeah. The whole nation started talking like that. We need to get back to church, man. We need to, they start quoting scriptures in Congress. Of course, they're so dumb, they don't even know that the scriptures they were quoting were to their own demise. Right? They didn't even know it. But they're trying to be all spiritual. We're going to rebuild stronger with the trees of Lebanon and this and that and, you know. If you ever have an opportunity to check that out, it'll blow your mind. The things that were said by our leaders during that time. But yeah, hey, awesome. Church attendance is busting at the seams. People are coming back. But something did not happen in this nation. There was no repentance. I never heard that word once during that whole period of time. 
What I heard over and over and over again is, we're going to build it back better this time. We are. Because we're in charge of our own destiny. And how long did it take? Not very long before, you know, people started going back where they came from. They kind of, they lost the fear. They found out, oh, we're going to live another day. Okay, so much for the God thing. Let's get back to the business of partying, sinning, stealing, whatever they do. There has to be repentance. You know, people, have, people that I respect over the years have told me, Tom, you need to keep a short account with the Lord. Don't let things pile up. Repent. Turn away from those things. Don't wait. Because the longer you wait, the more desensitized you become. And the more desensitized you become, the less are the chances that you really are going to truly repent. So I think that that's what's lacking in Asa's life. Perhaps. I know that's what was lacking in our nation. And I know that there's got to be Christians in these other countries that are experiencing all this craziness right now. And they're probably praying just like we pray. God help us. Give us strength. Protect us. So talk about a short reign, verse 15. In the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah, Zimri had reigned in Terzah for seven days. And the people were encamped against Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines. Now the people who were encamped heard it said that Zimri has conspired and also has killed the king. So all of Israel made Omri, the commander of the army, king over Israel that day in the camp. And then Omri and all of Israel with him went up from Gibbethon and they sieged Terzah. Wow, more peace, more wonderful things, more paradise, right? More death, more war. So it happened when Zimri saw the city was taken that he went into the citadel of the king's house and he burned the king's house down upon himself with fire and he died. Because of the sins which he had committed in doing evil in the sight of the Lord and walking in the way of Jeroboam and in his sin which he had committed to make Israel sin. <clears throat> These people have been around the block so many times it's round. And they're not learning a thing. Matter of fact, it's going to get worse. So then the people of Israel were divided into two parts. So we got, actually the nation of Israel divided into Israel and Judah, and now Israel can't even get along, and now they're divided. Half of them are following Tibni, the son of Genath, whoever that guy is, I have no clue, and made him king. The other half followed Omri. But the people who followed Omri prevailed over the people who followed Tibni the son of Ginnath. So Tibni died and Omni reigned. Omri reigned. So in the 31st year of Asa, again, he's still kicking, king of Judah, Omri becomes king over Israel and reigns 12 years. And for six years he reigned in Tirzah. And he bought the hill of Samaria from Shemer for two talents of silver. And then he built on the hill, called the name of the city which he built, Samaria, after the name of Shemer, the owner of the hill. And Omri did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He did worse than all who were before him. For he walked in all the ways of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in his sin by which he had made Israel sin, provoking the Lord God of Israel to anger with their idols." 
So the rest of the acts of Omri, which he did, and the might that he showed, they're written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel. Omri rested with his fathers, and he was buried in Samaria. And then Ahab, his son, reigned in his place. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, becomes king over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria for 22 years. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. It came to pass as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ithbaal, the king of the Sidonians. And he went and he served Baal and worshipped him. And then he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a wooden image. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel were before him. In his days, Heel of Bethel built Jericho. He laid its foundations with Abiram, his firstborn, and with his youngest son, Segub. <laughs> he set up its gates according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken through Joshua, the son of Nun. So, See a few developments here going along, historical developments. We see the origin of Samaria. This king went and bought it cheap with some silver and then built a city there, and it was named Samaria. So that city we find all the way through the Bible, all the way up to the time of Jesus, where Jesus has this very important appointment in Samaria. With the woman at the well, remember? So the Sumerian people, the Samaritan people, they interbred. They got their bloodlines all mixed up. And so the Jews, the purebloods, if you will, they looked upon them as half-breeds. That's why they didn't like the Samaritan people. That's why there was such a divide between them. But you... You see here in our text tonight uh, the origins of that, of that town. And we also get to see here that after all this time that uh, Hillel, or Hiel, however you would say his name, he begins to rebuild Jericho. Now you can actually go and there's more than one Jericho. The one that fell down and then the other ones that were rebuilt after that event took place with Joshua. Um, so again, another little historic event that takes place. And uh, this town is rebuilt again. I'm sure the walls were rebuilt again. Uh, why they would <clears throat> want to rebuild Jericho like that? Perhaps for strategic uh, reasons to have control of that area to protect their own uh, kingdoms. So <clears throat> we have a lot of different issues going on here. We've seen Asa hanging in there all the way through these two chapters, um, trying to do the right thing perhaps, uh, but not quite going far enough. Now, was that, because, was that like because Asa was a bad man? Or maybe it was because Asa came from a long line of fools, bad parents, bad examples, people who thought they could rebel against God. You know, that gets passed down. And if you notice here, one of the things that we see in the part of the pattern, we see the same things being said over and over and over, but now there's a new little statement being made. He did worse than all the other ones before him. So not only do these guys take after their dad, they become more wicked 
than their dad. And they do worse things. That should, you know, I know we don't have any real young parents in here tonight, but boy, I'll tell you, it's, it's kind of a slap in the face when, oh, we got one in the back back there. Of how we should have, perhaps, or how we did, parent our children. And you can tell a lot about that by what they're doing today and how they're living today, right? Of course, you can't force someone to do the right thing. You, you can invest in that. Um, we know what the Bible says about training up a child in the way he, that he should go. Uh, we know that it says that we shouldn't, we shouldn't spare the rod, which you could get in trouble for today if you did. Use it. Um, but uh, children need to learn discipline. They need to have an example from the parent whom they look up to. You know, it's weird. I, I can think back to when my oldest was about three. He thought I was Superman. He thought I was the all-end all. I was the greatest thing on the planet. That changed. <laughs> That changed over the years, uh, not to his fault, but my own. But, uh, but that's how some of, some of the little ones look up to us as parents. And you only get one shot. Now I have grandchildren, so that's kind of fun because you get maybe an extra try with them to uh, maybe right some wrongs there. So Anyway, we'll pick this up again next Wednesday. We're moving through here at breakneck speed. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, we want to thank you again for your word, for this record that we have of what it looks like when we turn our face against you. And we see that it's a horrible picture. And Lord, as we look around today in our own world, we're grieved as we see people behaving the same way. And their hearts are becoming harder and harder all the time. And Lord, I know you've called us to love everyone. You've called us to never give up on people. And so, Lord, I need to ask you tonight if you would just continue to put that in us, that love in us, that we would not become... Uh, judgmental, condemning people, that we could love the sinner and hate the sin, I guess, for a way to put it. But God, we know how, how much this world needs you and how much these people need you in their lives. And so many of them will never find you. So many of them are bound for eternal punishment. But we're thankful tonight, Lord, that you called us out of that. You turned our heads around. You've given us a destination. You've given us a compass to live by that doesn't change. And we thank you for that, Lord. So bless us as we leave this place the remainder of our week, Lord. May our light shine in the dark place. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.